We're glad you've joined us again for another episode of The Last Empire, Ancient Mysteries Reveal the Future. In our program this time, New Beginnings, Israel in the End Times, we're going to understand what this book says about Israel in the times in which we're living in. Now let's go, this, first of all, to New York to begin with. I love coming to New York. It's a fantastic place to visit, but I like seeing the Lady of Liberty, as we call her there, in the harbour of New York. You notice when um, the statue had been built there, this great colossus as it was called, Emma Lazarus wrote an interesting piece in connection with the, the Statue of Liberty. You can see it there. Notice what it says here. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. What did Emma Lazarus mean here? Because many people, millions of people from the shores of other countries where they were refugees, persecuted, very many reasons people came here to the United States to find a new beginning and a new freedom, a freedom and a new beginning. Many people came to this country. You know, this is not the only place where people have come for freedom and a new beginning. I came here to, uh, to Berlin and uh, when you come here to this place, you can see the old wall that once separated this city, the east from the west. But of course, in the late, 80, late 1980s, early 90s, the com when communism collapsed, this wall came tumbling down, or most of it. And uh, people came and wanted a new beginning and freedom with a new beginning there in Germany and other parts of communism, former communist countries, of course. Probably one of the most important examples of freedom and a new beginning took place here in Israel. You know, in 1948, the state of Palestine, or the state of Israel, was born there in Palestine in that year. And shortly after, almost the next day, the surrounding Arab nations declared war on this new state of Israel. In 1956, the Arabs struck again, but again, like as in 1948, the Israelis defeated them. In 1967, it was on again in what is known as the the Six-Day War. But again, the Israelis rallied and defeated the surrounding Arab nations. Uh, then, of course, in 1973, we have what is called the Yom Kippur War in that country, when on the Day of Atonement, the, some of the surrounding nations struck again. But again, Israel almost uh, came undone at that occasion, but rallied and defeated the surrounding Arab nations. And today, when you visit Israel, they've transformed much of the countryside in their country into a place where they grow so many amazing crops and so on. In fact, here is a great example of people looking for freedom and a new beginning because after the Second World War especially, many people came here to Israel from uh, Jewish people came here. You know, in fact, this situation in the land of Israel that has taken place since 1948, of course, many people see this as a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. They see that all these things that have transpired there since 1948 must be the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. What's the situation on this? Is this a fulfillment of Bible prophecy? In fact, you know, many Christians today pray for the peace of Jerusalem because they believe that the Israelites are God's children and so then we must pray for the peace of Jerusalem and we must support Israel. In fact, you know, U.S. foreign policy is directed that way, U.S. Middle East foreign policy, because of the pressure of Protestant groups in that country putting and, of course, the Israeli lobby as well, but in the, the Christians who lobby the government feel that, you know, this is God's people, so the United States should be supporting that country. And so U.S. foreign, Middle East foreign policy is directed toward that end. In fact, I remember watching a program on national television here in Australia when Bob Carr, the uh, former Prime Minister, pr former Premier of New South Wales, um, was being interviewed and he said, this is the reason for much of the United States um, interaction and involvement in 
Middle East politics is because of the strong Christian belief in their country that Israel is, the children of Israel are God's people and so they must be supported by Christians. Well, in our program, in the, this episode of our program, we want to have a look, what does the Bible say about this? We want to go to the book of Revelation to understand what does God say about Israel. We want to discover Israel in the end times in this episode. So let's go to the Bible to discover this together now. In this episode, we're going to dis dis discover that God is committed to freedom and a new beginning. No question about it. In fact, for freedom, we must take a stand. There's nothing surer than that. In fact, for freedom, God calls us to take a stand. And so we're going to understand that as we move. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 6 and 7. Because in Revelation 6 and 7, John sees the seven seals with the four horsemen of the apocalypse, as they're called. They come riding out of the pages of John's revelation. Under the sixth seal, John sees the climactic end time events of planet Earth just before and including the return of Jesus Christ the second time. The Bible says these words, Then the sky receded as a scroll, rolling up in other words, when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Notice that cryptic question. Who is able to stand? In other words, before the throne of God and the Lamb when Jesus Christ returns the second time. Now, that question, who can stand before the throne of God and the Lamb, is answered in the next chapter. Because as we said in a previous episode, there were no chapter divisions originally in the book of Revelation or the Bible. They were put in later so we could find those passages. So the passage just continues on from chapter 6 to chapter 7 automatically. And the answer to that question is found in chapter 7. Notice what the Bible says. John sees four angels. These four angels are pushing back the winds of strife, holding back the winds from beating up this planet because people need something. People are not yet ready for the end, for Christ to come. So notice what John sees now as he sees these four angels. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 7, verse 1, And he says, I saw another angel ascend from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Do not hurt the earth, the sea or the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So you will notice what John says next. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. So here's the question. Who can stand before the throne of God and the Lamb? The answer is given in those verses we've just read. This is what we need to stand before the throne of God and the Lamb. First of all, notice there's 144,000 Israelites. These are the ones who can stand. They have God's end time seal or mark in their forehead. These are the ones who can stand. Those are the ones, in other words, who are saved when Jesus returns. You have to be one of the 144,000 Israelites with that mark in order to be saved. Now, some of you are thinking, I, I'm not an Israelite. What chance is there for me? And uh, only 144,000. There's a 7 billion people on the planet. So where do I stand in all of this? So we need to get a handle on what John is talking about here very clearly, obviously. So let's notice 
Let's go to the book of Revelation and understand a few things. We are going to, by the way, just look at this phrase Israel. We'll understand about the 144,000 a little later in our series. We'll understand about what this mark is. But let's just get a handle, first of all, on what does it mean Israelites. So let's notice. Will only Israelites be saved when Jesus returns? Now, in the book of Revelation, you will appreciate that there are many symbols in this book, in the, the book of Revelation, many symbols. For example, and by the way, these symbols are all interpreted by the Bible itself. You don't have to guess at it or say Tom, Dick or Harry thinks that's what this means or Professor so-and-so or the priest or whoever it is. No, the Bible is its own interpreter. And so notice what the Bible indicates. First of all, in the book of Revelation, 28 times it mentions the Lamb of God. Now, unless you go to the rest of the Bible, you won't understand what this idea lamb is all about. It's not a four-footed lamb or something running around in heaven as John sees the lamb in heaven. No, it means Jesus sacrificed himself like those animals were sacrificed in the temples. The, the sacrificial lamb, Jesus died for the world. So the lamb is a symbol of Jesus and his death. Now what about Israel then? How do we understand this? Well, we would have to go back to the rest of Scripture to understand what this phrase means, Israelites. So let's do that together right now. What is an Israelite in the Bible? Notice what Paul says. Now, Paul, of course, was a, an Israelite himself. He was a Jewish man. But I want you to notice what he said in the book of Romans as he's writing to his Roman friends, Roman Christian friends. Paul the Israelite. Paul says in Romans 2.28, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. So he says, being a Jew in terms of the Bible is not just because I have the right nose or the right blood flowing in my veins. It's not something outward. It's something inward, not outward. Notice what he continues on and saying. He says, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart or the mind in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So Paul is saying very clearly that being a true Jew in the Bible sense is not a circumcision in in the flesh physically, but of the heart. Do I have a new heart and a new mind? The mind of Christ, the mind of God. So being an Israelite concerns the heart in this book. Now, what about the idea that Israel, the people of Israel, are the children of God? Anybody who's Jewish is the children of God. The right nose or the right features or the right blood. Is this what the Bible is talking about? Notice again, what Paul says as he writes to his friends in Rome again. Romans chapter 9, verse 6 to 8, the Bible says, They are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. The children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. So the Bible makes it very plain that just because a person is born from Jewish parents does not make that person a true Israelite. No, he says, the, the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, meaning the children just by, by, by natural means, there has to be more than that to be a true Israelite. Not all Israel are Israel, you notice, he said. Now, the Bible says these words in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, as Paul talks to his friends there in Galatia about this matter. He says, Galatians 3.16, Now to Abraham, he says, and his seed were the promises made. He does not say to seeds as of many, but as of one seed, singular. And to your seed, he says, which is Christ. Now this is interesting because Paul then 
goes on to say, in other words, what he's saying is Christ is the seed of Abraham. He's the real one that was promised to Abraham, not seeds as of many. No, 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 says Paul, this Jewish Christian man. He says, seed meaning one, Christ. And then he goes on to say, and if you are Christ, if you belong to Christ, if you've accepted him, Galatians 3.29, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Do you get what Paul is saying here? It's incredible when you think of what this Jewish man himself is saying. He's saying, look, Christ is what Abraham was promised, that one seed. Now, if you and I, Jew and non-Jew, belong to Christ, then because he is the seed of Abraham, and now we belong to Jesus, we're in him, then we are the seed of Abraham. We are his offspring because we are in Christ, who is the offspring of Abraham. So in Christ, you see, a person is a true Israelite as far as the Bible is concerned. Which is why Paul goes on to say in Galatians 3 verse 28, these words that he notes in this 28th verse. He says, Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul is not blind. He knows a male from a female. He knows a Jew from a non-Jew. What he's saying is when we're in Christ, we're all one in him. There are no distinctions. There are no favorites with God. When you and I are in Christ Jesus, whether we're rich or poor, whether we're Jew or non-Jew, we're all one. We all belong to the one family. We are all the Israel of God. One, Paul says. And that's the same point he notes when he writes to his Ephesian friends. In Ephesians chapter 2, notice what Paul said. He's talking to these non-Jewish people in Ephesus, there in Turkey. And he says to them these words in Ephesians chapter 2. Therefore, he says, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, you were non-Jewish, you non-Jewish people, remember that you, being non-Jewish people, who are called uncircumcision, that means you're not Jewish, by what is called the circumcision, by those who believe in those things to be truly Jewish, you were without Christ. You were being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You were not part of Israel, says Paul, and having no hope and without God in the world. But notice what he says next. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ who has made both, that's Jew and non-Jew, he's now made them both one, he says, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Now therefore, now watch what he says next, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners or aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, God's people, and members of the household of God, which is a term in the Bible for Israel. So now non-Jewish person can become part of Israel because they belong to Jesus. And a Jewish person must belong to Jesus to be truly Jewish. It's in Christ, the Bible says, that we find the way to be Jewish. In Christ, we are Israelites. In other words, today, true Israel is the Christian church, Jew and non-Jew in Christ Jesus. That's what the Bible is telling us very clearly from these passages of Paul, who of course himself was a Jewish man. So now, here's the question. How do you and I become an Israelite? Can, how does that happen? Notice what the Bible says as Paul is writing about this matter. He says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and 27, where we were a minute ago, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 
Notice very clearly what Paul says. And this is not the only place he says this. Go to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and he mentions baptism is the way. But here, let's go to 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit, he says, we are all baptized into one body. There it is again, into one. Whether we are Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So the way to be a true Israelite in the Bible sense is by baptism. That's the way the Bible says. In fact, baptism is mentioned 80 times in the, in the New Testament. So this means it's a vital topic to be mentioned so many times in the Bible writings. So then, what is the meaning of baptism? How do we understand the meaning of baptism that seems to be so important in the New Testament? Well, first of all, the first meaning of baptism is this. It means death to the sinful living. Death to sinful living or freedom from our old destructive lifestyle. That's the first meaning of baptism. Notice what Paul says as he writes to his Galatian, his Roman friends again in chapter 6 now. Romans 6. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death. Knowing this, that our old man, our old lifestyle, our old way of living was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So that's the first thing. But there's a second meaning to baptism that Paul signals out right here in this same passage. He says, number two, it is the meaning of baptism is new life, the freedom to live a dynamic and purpose-filled life. This is the second meaning of baptism. Notice his passage as he shares this with his Roman friends. Just as Christ, he says, was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now if we died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. So not only death, says Paul, to the old life, my old life has died with Christ, but also I have a new life now in Christ, like he came out of the grave, so I have a new life, a new life of powerful, loving living, which is why Paul summed these two great beliefs or meanings up in one phrase in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He said these words, to his friend in Galatia. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Notice what Paul is saying here. You see, my old life is gone and I've come to a new life. It's the life of Jesus living, me, living in me, a life of purpose-filled, powerful living indeed. But there's one more meaning to baptism that baptism means, one more aspect. And Paul says this. It's, the third thing is it means I belong. I'm a child of God by adoption. Notice what Paul says when he writes to his Ephesian friends having predestined us to adoption as sons or children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. What an amazing thing that the Bible is telling us here. We are the children of God. Now he says that in Galatians 3 verse 26 and 27, again when he's connected it with baptism. Notice what he says now again. For you, you are all the sons or the children of God through faith in Jesus. For as many of you 
as were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Here is very clearly, the Bible says, how we become the children of God. We put Christ on in baptism and we become the children of God by adoption. I love coming here to the shores of Gallipoli in Turkey here. And uh, it's a great pleasure of mine to be able to bring people here from Australia and New Zealand to the shores of this, this place here, Gallipoli, because, of course, this was here where in 1915 the Anzacs, the, the New Zealand soldiers and the Australian soldiers, the Brits and, and others from the Commonwealth, came ashore here on that morning there, early in the morning. The, the ships arrived and those men fought their way up to the cliff areas. And uh, there, of course, the Turks met them. And then, you know the story, tragically, many young Australian and New Zealand soldiers are buried up here on the shores of the, the Anzac area, the Gallipoli Peninsula and so on. And uh, when you visit this place, it's a sobering place to visit. You see where the Kiwis almost were able to, 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 to have the Allies so that they were able to take the, uh, this area, but the Turks under Ataturk pushed them back. It's an amazing place to visit. But you know, when you think about it, these Australian soldiers, these Kiwi soldiers, the Brits and so on, these were all aliens to the Turks. These were foreigners. They were on the foreign land. And one of the most amazing things is the attitude that the Turkish people have to these soldiers who were killed up here and are buried here in Turkey at Gallipoli. Ataturk himself put up a monument, and you can visit this monument today. It's, a, it's an amazing monument to see here. And uh, let me read what's on this monument that you can visit here at Anzac Cove, there on the shores of Gallipoli. Notice what is written on this monument that you can see right now uh, in, in, there on the screen. And uh, Ataturk wrote those words there himself. He said, those heroes, talking of the, the, the Anzac soldiers, those heroes that shed their blood and lost their lives are now living in the soil of a friendly country. Therefore rest in peace. There is no difference, he went on to say, between the Johnnies, that's the, the Brits, the Anzac soldiers, the Aussies and the Kiwis and so on, and the Mermets, the Turkish soldiers, no difference between those to us where they lie side by side in this country of ours. You, the mothers who sent their sons from faraway countries, wipe away your tears. Your sons are now living in our bosom and are in peace. After having lost their lives on this land, they have become our sons as well. What an amazing attitude when you think of it. Here were these foreigners really to the Turks, these aliens, now they're treated as the sons of the Turkish people because of, the, through their death. But you think now, enemy aliens became sons of the Turkish people through death. And what about this picture that the New Testament is painting now? We become the sons and daughters of God, the children of God, through the death of and the resurrection of Jesus. That's how we become the children of God. Even though we were aliens and enemies, now we are the children of God. What an amazing picture. So when you visit, when you see a baptism, you see three things. Number one, a baptism is a funeral. Someone's dying. Their old life is dying. They're putting away their old past way of living. Number two, you see a resurrection. Somebody's coming to a new life in baptism. And finally, you see an adoption. Somebody's becoming a child of the God of heaven. What an amazing picture. Now, this is the meaning of baptism. Three great truths. Our old life is gone. We now have a new life in Jesus, and we're the children of God. But what's the method of baptism in the Bible? What's the way that people were baptized in the Bible? You know, I've heard of many methods of baptism. I've heard of baptism uh, by sprinkling. I've heard of baptism with rose petals. That would be sweet, wouldn't it? 
I've even heard of baptism with salt. I guess that's to preserve people. I've even heard of baptism over the telephone. I guess you could call that the dry cleaning method. But many different forms of baptism, baptism by immersion. What is the biblical method of baptism? How does this book portray the method? One thing's for sure, the Bible says there's actually only one method of baptism. Notice what Paul says. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. In the Bible, there's only one baptism with its one method of baptism. Now, what was that method? Well, if we want to understand the method of baptism in the Bible, we would need to go and see how was Jesus baptized? What was the way he was baptized? So let's have a look at that together right now. You know, the Bible says of Jesus when he was baptized, we go to Mark chapter 1 and verse 9. And when we read Mark chapter 1 verse 9, we see how he was baptized. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now you will notice when he had been baptized, the Bible says, Jesus came up immediately from the water. So when you see biblical baptism, you will find that people go into water and then they come up out of the water. For biblical baptism, you must go into water and come out. That's the way Jesus was baptized. Now there's another example in the Bible, in the book of Acts. We read of how there was an Ethiopian man who was baptized by Philip. One day the Bible says Philip um, was impressed by the Spirit of God to go over and help an Ethiopian man who was reading the Bible. He was the treasurer of one of the great queens from down toward in Ethiopia, one of the kings and queens of Ethiopia there. And he's traveling back from Jerusalem in his chariot and he's reading the writings of the prophet Isaiah chapter 53 in his chariot. He was the treasurer. And, uh, and uh, he doesn't really understand what he's reading. Now, of course, Isaiah was one of those great books found in the Dead Sea Scroll collection. And the 53rd chapter is about the fact that the Messiah would be crucified or die. And he doesn't know what it's meaning. And so Philip is impressed by God. Go over and help that man understand. So Philip runs over to the chariot and he says, Do you know what you're reading about, sir? The man said, how can, I, how can I understand unless someone shows me? So come up in the chariot. And so Philip got up in the chariot and he explained to this man what this passage was saying about Jesus, how he would die. And so Philip then explained to him how a person can be right with God, how they can have a new life. And as they were journeying along together, they came across some, some water as they passed. And the, the Ethiopian said, hey, listen, listen. Uh, there's some water over there. What hinders me from being baptized? Why can't I get baptized? So notice what happens next in the story. So the Bible says in Acts chapter 8, verse 38, So he, that's the Ethiopian treasurer, he commanded the chariot to stand still. He said to his driver, stop. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water and so on, Philip went on his way and so did the Ethiopian. He went on his way rejoicing because he was a, now a child of, of God. So you'll notice again in this story that these two men both went into the water, the one baptizing and the one being baptized. So in biblical baptism again, you go into water and you come up out of the water. This is the, the method of of biblical baptism. In fact, the word baptism means to dip under, to immerse, to plunge under. Now, if you were going to baptize your car, for example, you could not get the hose out and spray the car with your hose. No, 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 you, that's not baptism in the, the meaning of the Greek word here. You would have to take your car and drive it under the river. And of course, that wouldn't do it a lot of good. But that's how you'd baptize your car. You have to go right under the water for biblical baptism. Now, that's why John, when he was baptizing, he had to go to a place where there was a lot of water. 
Notice what it says in John 3, verse 23. The Bible says, Now John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. Now you can appreciate, if baptism was by sprinkling a few drops on people, a bucket full of water would have John would have done John for thousands of people. He could have sprinkled a few drops from a little bucket. But he had to be in a place where there was much water because in baptism you have to put people right under the water to be a true biblical baptism. Much water is needed in biblical baptism. And so the Bible, that's why the Bible says there's one Lord, there is one faith, there is one baptism and that baptism form is by immersion. Now a father and son were arguing one day over the method of baptism. They were disagreeing considerably among themselves over what was the method of baptism. And the father said, look son, baptism is by sprinkling. And the, the, the son said, no dad, baptism means you, 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 you have to be buried in the water, you have to go under the water. And so they argued backwards and forwards and finally the father said, listen boy, we better stop arguing, we'll be here all day. Listen, he said, let's go and do some chores. And then he said to the son, just before he went off to do his work, he said, now remember son, last night the old rooster died. The old rooster died last night and I want you to bury that rooster today. And then they went off to do their work. Well, that night they came back from their, their work and the father was furious. He was as angry as a, as a meat axe, as we say. And he said to the boy, I thought I told you to bury that rooster today. I thought I told you to bury the thing, but you, all you did was sprinkle a few grains of sand on him. Well, said the son, that's what you told me burial was. You just sprinkled a little bit of stuff on top. <laughs> and the father got the point. If you're going to bury the old rooster, you've got to put him under the dirt, just like what happens in baptism, to bury in water means you put under the water. All right, so this is the method of baptism. You'll notice it here on the screen right now. Here are people being baptized. You will notice people go under the water. Their old life is gone. The new life has come as they come up by faith in Jesus. Here we go again. Notice here in Africa, our baptism into Jesus, his death and raised to a new life as we come join him in his resurrection. Buried with him in baptism, raised to a new life. This is the meaning of baptism. You notice the method fits the meaning. Now, if we were to go around different places in the, in the ancient world, we would find that for many centuries, people were baptized by this method of being put right under the water. For example, let's take some, a tour to some different cathedrals and old churches from down through the centuries. We can come here to Ephesus. You can see right here the Church of Mary. Now here in the Church of Mary, you can see on the far right, there's a pool that was about three feet deep. This was a baptistry in this church just outside of Ephesus back to about the 5th or 6th century AD. Here they used to go down these steps and they were buried under the water or put under the water and raised up in this church. Just down the road there's another great church, the Basilica of St John. You can visit this basilica. You'll know that it's in the shape of a cross here. And the, there were steps about three feet or a metre deep leading down into the water and they used to baptise them by immersion way back around the 6th century AD. Let's go to the church of St John of Laterano over there in Rome. And here you will notice that there's a, a sort of an octagonal shaped building and inside you have a circular baptistry here, again about a metre deep. Now they used to fill this up and people were immersed in this great church of the popes back in the centuries in the past. But now they just use the centre part to sprinkle people and so on, little infants. Then we come here to St Paul's Church outside the walls of the city of Rome. Here you'll notice around the roof of this building in marble, it says, Baptis Ati in Simus in Christu Jesus, baptism into Jesus Christ. And again, it's about a metre deep, three feet deep, where they used to put people under the water in immersion 
baptism in this great church uh, there in Rome. Finally, we come to the old leaning tower of Pisa here. Now, you notice that tower that's leaning. That's the bell tower of the great church complex here. The church is in the center there of the screen, but onto the right, inside another building just next door to the cathedral as part of this complex, there's an octagonal shaped baptistry there up on those steps where about a meter deep where people were immersed in the ancient past, but no longer is baptism practiced that way. But for many centuries, this was the way baptism was practiced. In fact, Ch Cardinal James Gibbon, Remember we mentioned him the other day in a quote that this, this gentleman made, this priest in the Church of Rome made. Notice what he said about the matter of baptism. He said, For several centuries after the establishment of Christianity, baptism was usually conferred by immersion, putting people under the water. But, he says, since the 12th century, since about 1200, 1100, 1200 AD, the practice of baptizing by infusion, that means sprinkling, has prevailed in the church. As this manner, he says, is attended with less inconvenience than baptism by immersion. What a tragedy. The, the cardinal points out that's what used to be, but now this has changed. But it's changed because of convenience. You know, my friend, since when do we do things by convenience? If this book says this is the way, then this is the way. God doesn't want us to do just things because they may be convenient or not to do them because they're inconvenient. God wants us to follow his instructions because he knows what is best. And so tragically, this took place in the Christian church. Now, how important is baptism actually? How important is it? Is it a big deal? Let's notice what the Bible says about the importance of baptism. Jesus is speaking and he says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. You notice baptism here is clearly connected to salvation. It's important according to Jesus. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now Jesus commanded baptism in fact. You will notice when Jesus was commissioning the disciples to go to all the world to preach the gospel. Notice what he said. Go therefore, Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing. In fact, Jesus commanded that the church baptize people. Peter on the day of Pentecost, when he was preaching to those great crowds there in Jerusalem, notice what Peter said about baptism. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, the Bible says, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Peter said, Baptism is important for forgiveness of sin and the reception of the Holy Spirit. This is a vital matter, you see. Jesus connected it to salvation, commanded the church, and Peter says it's connected to forgiveness of sin, in fact, and the reception of the Holy Spirit. So it's important. Now, baptism, baptism doesn't mean that you're perfect. It's just the beginning of the Christian journey. It's not graduation. It's the initiation or the initiation into Christianity, the beginning of the Christian journey with Jesus. Baptism gives us freedom when we approach it in the right way. Baptism gives new spiritual power in our lives when we are baptized with faith. This is the meaning and the importance of baptism, not that we're perfect. Baptism, of course, isn't magical. Just because a person goes into the water, that itself doesn't do anything. You know, a duck might as well get baptized. No, we must approach baptism by faith. Notice the way Paul put it here. And then it has meaning for our life. Acts, sorry, in the book of Colossians, Paul said these words. In him, in Jesus, he says in Colossians, in him you were also circumcised, 
a sign of being an Israelite, you remember, being circumcised. That's what the Israelites were. They were circumcised. So as we come to this passage in Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, let's read it carefully here. Notice carefully what Paul is saying. In him you also were circumcised, a sign of being an Israelite, with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by taking away the old way of living, the sinful living out of our life. Then he says, how? By the circumcision of Christ. And what is the circumcision of Christ? Paul goes on to say, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him. Now he says, we're raised with him, how? Through our faith in the working or the power of God who raised him from the dead. So baptism, baptism is not magical just because you get wet. Baptism, it's the baptism of faith in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. When I put my trust in Christ who died and rose again, that's when those things become a reality to me as I follow God in that rite of baptism by faith in the power of God. Now, what are the steps to baptism? What steps should a person take before so that they can be baptised? The Bible gives us three important steps. Notice the first one. The first one is that we repent, a genuine sorrow for sin, in other words, and a turning away from sin, leaving it behind in our hearts. The Bible puts it this way. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized. So repentance is the first step that a person should make in as he prepares, he or she prepares for baptism. What's the second step that a person needs to make? Notice the second step now. This is to believe, pardon me, to believe or to accept Jesus as master and Lord of your life. That's step number two. And the Bible puts it this way. Mark chapter 16, verse 16, Jesus speaking, he who believes, in other words, who puts their trust As we saw that John Patton meant he who reclines on Jesus and is baptised will be saved. This is the second step that is needed to be taken toward baptism. But there's a third step and that is this. We must learn. In other words, we must be instructed in the essentials of the biblical faith. That's the third thing and Jesus himself said that. He said these words when he said to make disciples. He said, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, and notice what he linked to it, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. So a person must be instructed in the things of biblical faith before they are baptized. So this is why in the Bible... There is no such thing as infant baptism. You see, because babies can't repent. They're too young to understand what sin is all about. Babies can't believe they don't understand. They're just too young to be able to understand those things. And of course, babies can't be taught the essentials of biblical faith or the biblical teachings of Christianity. That's why the Bible doesn't support biblical uh, uh, infant baptism. Now, of course, God had a great regard for the children, a great regard for the children. Jesus gathered the children around him and he blessed them. He dedicated them. He laid his hands on them and, and, and blessed the children. God loves the children, but dedication is not baptism. You will recall Jesus was dedicated himself when his parents took him to the temple just eight days after he was born. But this is not baptism. He was baptized years later when he was 30 years of age in his case. So dedication is not baptism. Uh, Dedication is a blessing that God will protect the lives of these little children. Jesus loved the children, no question about it. In fact, Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the the kingdom of God. You'll never get to heaven unless you become like a child, Jesus said, meaning trusting and, and following the ways of God. So 
here is the Bible's understanding of this. Now, someone asked this question, I can almost hear you thinking it yourself. Should I be rebaptized? Well, the answer to this is yes and no to that question. You see, yes, if I haven't been baptized by immersion, because if I was sprinkled, this is not biblical baptism. The Bible way is clear, as we've seen, it, we, it must be by immersion. So yes, if I've been sprinkled as a child, uh, I need to be rebaptized, baptized by immersion, the way Jesus was. Now our parents, of course, did the best for us, the best that they understood. But now that we know and understand what the Bible teaches, we need to follow and do what the way God wants us to do it ourselves. So yes, if I haven't been baptised by immersion. And of course, yes, if I've raised the old sinful life. So say I turned my back on Jesus. I was once a follower of Jesus. I had been baptised into Christ, but then I turned away and I went way out and left Christ behind and wanted no more to do with him and just went out into the world and lived a lifestyle that was totally contrary to the principles of Christ in this book. Yes, I would need to be rebaptized. Why? Because the old man needs to be put down, because that's what baptism means. The old way of living needs to go. So, yes, this would certainly be a reason for being rebaptized. And yes, of course, even if I've learned significant new truth. There was an example of that in the New Testament, where people who had learned significant new truth were rebaptized. Notice it with me here in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. Paul comes to Ephesus. Notice what, he said, what it says in Acts chapter 19. Paul came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. He said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there was nothing wrong, of course, with John's baptism. Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan and he received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came on Jesus at his baptism, as you recall. The heavens were open and so there was nothing wrong with John's baptism. But they didn't even know that there was a Holy Spirit. They had never even heard of the Holy Spirit. That's a significant teaching in the Bible. And so when they understood, they were baptized into Jesus Christ. So if we learn significant new teaching, this is a good reason for being rebaptized. Now, like the Sabbath, for example, this is one of the very commandments of God, written with God's own finger, a significant teaching. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, we saw. So teachings that are significantly new, yes, this would be a good reason. What about if I make a mistake? No, we don't need to be rebaptized when we sin. But when in, 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 but I stay with Jesus. So if I make a mistake, I kick my toe, so to speak, as a Christian, meaning I make a mistake. I don't have to be rebaptized every time. In fact, Peter, you remember when Jesus washed the disciples' feet that last night before he died, he came to Peter and, 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 and Peter, Peter said, you'll never wash my feet. And uh, Jesus said, well, if I can't wash your feet, Peter, you can't have a part of me. So Peter said, well, wash me all over. And Jesus said, no, no, Peter. If you've had a bath, you only need to have your feet washed. In other words, Peter, when you make a mistake, we don't need to have a bath again every time, but just your feet washed, so to speak. Not have to be rebaptized. So know when I sin, but I'm staying with Jesus, not walking away and leaving Jesus behind and going out into the world. This is the teaching of the Bible. A uh, friend of mine, Mark Finley, was running a series of meetings like this in, in uh, the Moscow in the, United, in the former Soviet Union just after the collapse of communism. And, and coming to the, these meetings of his, uh, there was a, a Russian family and as they came time for the baptism, they had a crusade baptism and so on, one of the boys in the family, he wanted to get baptised but he had cancer and by this time he was so sick he couldn't join 
the baptism and he wanted to be baptized into Jesus. And uh, Mark visited them in their home and the boy said, Pastor Mark, baptize me. Mark said, look, you're too sick to be baptized. It's, God doesn't expect this when you, you can't, you know, you're so sick and you're just, a, you know, you're on the edge of death's door. But the, man, the young man said, no, please, Pastor Mark, I want to be baptized. Well, Mark didn't know what to do for a moment, but he asked the, the mother of the household, do you have a bath? Well, she said, yes, we do. So they filled the bath up and Mark baptized that young man in the, in the bathtub. You know, here was a young man who saw what it means to follow Jesus. We need to follow Jesus all the way. And I'm convinced that you want to follow Jesus. Why don't you make that decision today to be baptized into Jesus by immersion if you've never been baptized? If you wandered from Jesus and you're coming back to God, why don't you make that decision? If you've learned significant new truth, why don't you make that decision to follow Jesus in baptism like those people in Ephesus? Well, we're glad that you joined us again for this episode today. Don't miss the next program that we have coming up in our last empire, Ancient Mysteries Revealed the Future programs. We're going to be talking about the Dragon Slayers, Maximum Impact Living. Don't miss that program because this is going to help you and I to be able to get the edge on this enemy of our soul who wants to cause us to lose our eternity. You're going to understand how to be able to stand faithful to God incredibly in this episode that's coming. We trust that you'll join us in that next episode of The Last Empire, Ancient Mysteries Reveal the Future.